everyone. Welcome to the introduction of village and community in India, an interface. This lecture is part of your paper on community media and society. This lecture will introduce you to the dynamics of social, political, administrative relations between village society and different communities of the village. Indian village society is usually depicted as a homogeneous, static, self-sufficient unit with little or no interference from the outer world. All the disputes are resolved by the village panchayat and state had virtually no role to play in the internal affairs of the village society. However, closer scrutiny of the village level documents reveals that Indian village society was highly stratified. Given the all-pervasive hierarchical division based on caste, it is not a surprise that village society was also divided into various communities. Part 1. Characteristics of the village The Mughal era villages were called as Deh in Persian and Moza in Rajasthani. An old settled village was called as Kadimi old or Asli original. If some people moved out of the Asli village and got settled in a nearby area, it was called Thani or Izafa addition to the village. Another category of villages was of such villages which got deserted by some natural disaster or was abandoned by people due to exploitation by Jagirdar. Such villages were known as Viran or desolate villages. The village was the smallest unit in the Mughal land revenue system. The state demanded the land revenue in cash or in kind. Part 2. Conventional Portrayal of Village Society Uttar Meryur inscription is an important testimony to the working of Sabhas in 10th century Chola Kingdom. You can read about the Uttar Meryur inscription in the e-text. Character of village society as depicted in the Uttar Meryur inscription has been appropriated by scholars to argue that Indian village society was self-sufficient and static. During medieval period for purposes of land revenue and village societies were documented and relied upon to determine the revenue demand. Similar trend was seen during the British period with a difference that their primary objective was to locate the owner of the land so to fix the responsibility of tax on him or her. Unlike any previous regimes, company was interested only in know-how of the land revenue system and the nature of land rights when they got right to get the land revenue. The East India Company wanted to know the ownership of land, was it with the peasant or zamindar or the village community or was it the state itself the company revenue officers relied upon the accounts of french traveler bernier to solve this riddle bernier tried to understand mughal state with the lens of french autocracy and therefore he took the state as the sole proprietor of the land even though contrary evidences were available the East India Company deliberately borrowed this erratic understanding of land rights to claim the ownership of the land and grab the fertile plains of Bengal province. The other reason for developing an understanding of the village community was the need to maintain the law and order situation in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. The prominent revenue officers of East India Company were Charles Metcalf, James Mill, Elphinstone, Sir Henry Main, and Baden Powell, etc. These officers were instrumental in constructing the new idea of a village community. Metcalf called the institutions of village community as the true republic, whereas James Mill gave village community the name of a corporation. Since usually village was considered as a unit of land revenue collection, the role, functioning and relations with village as an administrative unit were often ignored 
and never documented. Therefore, Sir Henry believed it to be a self-regulating organization. The modern researchers, however, differ from these propositions that it was destroyed by the centralized administration of the Mughals. The nature of land rights in a village was the basis to define the village community in the Mughal period. Part 3. Agricultural Communities The village community was roughly divided into agricultural and non-agricultural communities. A big village constituted mixed population of various castes and classes whereas a small village had only agriculturists. Even the agricultural communities were not homogeneous, rather socially and economically stratified and differentiated. The socially, economically and even politically zamindars constituted the uppermost rung. It was the duty of zamindar to collect land revenue from the village and submit it in the office of Jagirdar's agent called Amil. The zamindar got concessions in land revenue on his own produce in lieu of his service to the state. The zamindar maintained his large land holdings by employing hired labor of Pahikasht peasants. Most prosperous and powerful community of the village was the zamindars who kept their personal military units in small forts in villages of North India. The upper caste peasant communities belonging to Rajput, Brahmin, Mahajan etc. castes were offered concessions in the land revenue by the Mughal state. The wealthy village communities belonging to higher caste had the means of production such as plough, bullocks, seeds and artificial means of irrigation such as wells, Persian wheel etc. Such communities or peasants were known as Gahurhala in Rajasthan. The third category of peasant community was of common peasants belonging to intermediary castes named Jat, Ahir, Gujjar, Mali, Meena, Mio, etc. This community of peasants formed the majority in a village society and it bore the maximum brunt of land revenue. They had to surrender up to one third share of the produce as land revenue. But after adding several miscellaneous taxes, the actual rate of taxation was between 40 to 50 percent. The community of peasants had to take loans at exorbitantly high rates from Mahajans or usurers to somehow manage agriculture. The Rajasthan sources record the name of the class as Palti, whereas for North India, Irfan Habib identifies them with Riyaya Kasht and Beer Grover has named them Mukaria. Another community of peasants of the village community was known as Pahikasht. Pahikasht peasants were basically poor migrants who had come from other village or Pargana. Another community of peasants were wandering peasant troops who could be settled on abandoned villages by revenue officers. The land revenue officer Amil offered land at concessional rates to the Pahikasht peasants. Despite all the hard work and farming on concessional lands, the economic and social condition of the community of Pahikasht peasant remained poor and his social status remained low. Another community of peasants existed in the village was of Kameen or Loli. The community of Kameen peasants was of low castes who did not possess any land and survived only by selling their labor in agricultural activists. These were mainly Chamar, Cobbler, Thanak, Weaver, Koli, Thori, etc., who were engaged in agricultural jobs mainly at the time of sowing and harvesting. In fact, this class was the backbone of the entire system of village agricultural production. It is to be noted that at least till the times of Mughals, land was in abundance. Yet, there were landless communities in the villages. Since human labor was most prized requirements, the menial communities were never allowed to own land. The village society tried to utilize the labor of menial communities for their own purposes and kept it as a reserve for their own farming activities. 
The Mughal state did not interfere with the caste system of India. The basis of the village community division was entirely caste and economic condition which decided the status of the peasant in the village society. Part 4. Non-agricultural communities. Another set of village communities in the village society was that of non-agriculturist communities. These were mainly professional, artisanal castes. The 19th century ethnographic reports note that a large village usually had people of several communities and professionals such as peasant, sahukar or usura, clergyman, khati or carpenter, luhar or ironsmith, nai or berber, kumhar or potter, chamar or cobbler, thanak or weaver, bhangi or the scavenger, dazi, tailor, thobi or washerman, sakka, water carrier, teli, oil presser, Mirasi, singers, doom, dancers, etc. These professional communities were given a fixed amount of produce or grains at the time of harvest in lieu of their services to the peasants. This system was known as the Jajmani system. This economic system of interdependence tied both the agriculturist and non-agriculturist or professional classes to each other. Some large villages had oil presser people, Teli, who had Khana, a machine to cold press the oil to extract oils of sunflower and sesame, which they used to sell in nearby towns. However, most of these professional communities worked for the village society. Khati or carpenter and Luhar or ironsmith were very important in the village community as they made agricultural tools. Similarly, Nai or Barber was important in marriage rituals in addition to his primary duty of cutting hair. Taylor, Goldsmith or Sunar and Cloth Dyer or Rangrez had higher status than the communities of Minials as it included skilled work. However, communities of Mason or Mystery and Fisherman or Machera considered lowly in the village. Though the primary work of community of cobblers was to make and mend shoes, but most of the cobblers worked as agricultural labors. The community of scavengers or bhangis performed the cleaning works and other odd jobs like removing the carcasses of animals and removing its flesh and sold it onward to the cobblers. The professional communities lived in their respective separate neighborhoods. Whereas, the lowly manuals had to live outside the village main settlement. So the village society with all its diverse communities formed a harmonious and cooperative social unit. The Mahajans were a very important community. The Mahajans were a very important community in the land revenue system as they purchased the agricultural produce from peasants and sold it to the nearby town which in turn was used to feed the army or was sent to be sold in other towns and cities. The rich peasant communities cultivated cash crops for selling them at high prices in the market. The common cash crops were indigo, sugarcane, cotton, sesame, vegetables, etc. Thus, the village society was integrated with the market economy and became an important constituent of the economic system. The professional communities and lower caste community of the village also depended directly on the agricultural production as they were mostly paid in kind by the peasants. Thus, the village had become a self-sufficient unit portrayal and questioning of self-sufficiency. The nature of self-reliance of the Indian villages differed from what Karl Marx had proposed for the Indian villages. According to Marx, the Indian village society was comprised of communities of peasants, artisans and service classes who produced only for their own consumption and not for the market. But we see that in the Mughal era, Indian village communities were not stagnant. The village society was well informed and vigilant towards the fluctuating market prices of different crops and therefore 
peasant communities cultivated the suitable crops accordingly. Only the wealthy communities of peasants could afford cultivating cash crops as it required capital inputs for irrigation sources like well, Persian wheel, tenkili, etc. On the other hand, most of the peasant communities were cultivating a couple of crops for mere subsistence as they lacked the means of production for advanced farming. Some rich peasant communities also lent money to small peasants and mortgaged their fertile land on non-payment of the loan money. Rajasthani sources are replete with such examples where big landlords grabbed lands of small peasant communities. This was a very well-practiced trick played by wealthy peasant communities to seize more and more lands which was a manifestation of the internal class conflict in the village society. Maximum burden of the land revenue tax was borne by the communities of small peasants who had to pay as high as 50% of the produce as tax. The peasant communities except wealthy and upper caste communities had to pay many additional taxes apart from regular land revenue such as malba, common financial pool, Hasil Maweshi, cattle tax, Hasil Khascharai, grazing tax, Hasil Jhopri, house tax, Hasil Halatki, plough tax, etc. The peasant communities also charged with the allowance of the land revenue officers. The issue of cultivable land ownership is of prime importance to understand the nature of village society in the Mughal period. The East India Company recognized the Mughal state emperor as the proprietor of the agriculture land and justified the land grab in Bihar, Orissa and Bengal after the Battle of Baksar. The debate about the ownership of land in Mughal period has been clinched by the modern researchers who proved that the real owner of the land were the peasant communities. The state had given proper written documents of proprietorship to all the peasant patta. The document contained detailed information about the irrigation sources the peasant had, the number of ploughs and bullocks they owned, the crops cultivated in the season, etc. Nobody could evict the peasant from his land until he is regularly paying the land revenues. He had every right to mortgage, sell or cultivate his land. But the Pahikash category of peasants did not have the right of land ownership in the Mughal India. The notion of Gram Panchayat has been carved out by the British revenue officers who presented it as a sacred institution, which has continued to thrive since centuries. The Mughal period sources don't expatiate much about the Gram Panchayats and its nature. Gram Panchayats was some sort of village council, but it is difficult to say anything with surety about its nature. But it is difficult to say anything with surety about its nature, functions and work policy. Its members probably belonged to the wealthy communities and its chief was called Patel. The village council settled small issues and disputes of the village folk. The disputes were settled as per discretion of the members and tradition of the village. However, few scholars deny the existence of a functional village council. Had the institution of village council existed in villages, there would have no need of land revenue officials. The Hasil Farohi section of Arshatta documents highlight how limited influence these village councils had on the affairs of village society and its various communities. The Arsattas contain information pertaining to crime incidents like grain theft, cattle lifting, rape, chamchori, marital issues and local disputes etc. But surprisingly, all these cases were reported to the office of Amil, highest land revenue officer of a Pargana, where the Amil used to settle the issues by imposing penalty according to the nature and gravity of the crime committed. This clearly demonstrates that village councils were not very important during the Mughal era.
Nonetheless, there were caste panchayats in Rajasthan which settled the intra-caste issues and disputes. The Rajput states had given recognition to these caste panchayats which mainly sided with the rich and influential people by and large. Part 6. Changes and Continuity Late 17th and 18th centuries saw a change in land rights which subsequently altered the character of village society. The community of Zamindars, with strong economic, social and military background, snatched away the lands of weaker communities, of lower castes, taking advantage of the peasant rebellions and poor law and order situation. The Rajats of Agra and Delhi, Suba, chased away Gujar, Mios, Tiagi, Mali, Nina and Khanzada communities from their lands which belonged to them since Akbar's times. As the new communities of big zamindars emerged, small zamindars lost the right to collect land revenue. The change in zamindari land rights changed the traditional structure of village and destroyed the brotherhood that existed for centuries. The other major effect of these changes was the emergence of Izardari system, which became a big reason for discontent among the peasant communities. The early 18th century saw big rebellions by peasant and zamindar communities against the Mughal Empire, which had caused havoc in the village society and agricultural way of life. British economic and administrative policies ruined the basic structure of village society by changing power relations among the village communities of Mughal period. The colonial policies rendered a large number of peasant communities into landless laborers. The basis of land revenue during the Mughal period was production, which changed to land in the colonial period. The peasant community had to take loans from the communities of Mahajans to pay land revenue which reduced the landed peasant communities to landless labourer. The community of weaver who had weaved rough cotton clothes on the looms for the peasant communities were now pushed out of work. Newspapers and radios disseminated the anti-imperial ideas among the village society and its agricultural and non-agricultural communities. Consequently, great leaders emerged from the ranks of peasants who participated in the national movement or for freedom. The freedom movement linked the regional identity to the national identity. The economic and social conditions of the village society and its communities changed once again in the independent India. The national economic growth spurred by introduction of new techniques influenced the village communities as well. Canal irrigation stimulated agricultural production. The new agricultural tools and machines enabled weaker peasant communities to modernize and as a result power structure of village society changed again. The constitution of independent India granted universal adult franchise which was a revolutionary step to bring a change in a village society. The right to vote brought upper caste and lower caste communities at the same platform where everybody's vote had an equal value. The lower caste communities attained a new status and asserted their rights in the village society and the old power relations got shattered. Vote bank politics has also played important role in changing the interface between communities and village society. The political parties are treating different communities as vote banks and spreading hatred against each other to gain electoral benefits. The malicious campaign of hatred has divided communities and shattered the unity and fraternity of a village society. The old traditions of sharing and caring of the rural society are now lost. This characterizes the 21st century form of village community. Conclusion Summing up this lecture, we hope that you have understood that the neoliberal policies are wrecking havoc in the village society in India where 
the disparity in income and wealth has risen to an all-time high. But at the same time, crimes are going up. Jealousy and enmity has risen in a village society. The current political culture is responsible for this degradation in humanitarian values, which has left the village society in search for a new identity. For more details, please read the e-text of this lecture properly and attempt the questions in the end. Thank you.